This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast from booktopia.com.au, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the books we're reading. I'm Mark Harding, and I am joined by Booktopians Amy and Eden, and from Words and Nerds, Danny V. Hi, guys. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm super excited. Of course. We love having you. So let's jump straight into it. Uh, I'm going to start with Eden today. What are you reading, and what are you liking about it? Oh, okay. I've been in a bit of a middle grade craze lately and I picked up Seven Where We Away by Samantha Ellen Bound. Uh, this is a new release and I could I could honestly read this book like 10 times over. The first line, the opening line says, Ferdinand fell out of the sky on the hottest day of the year while Celeste and Esmeralda Barden were on the front porch eating ice cream. So, I mean, if that doesn't hook you, I don't know what will. <laughs> but um, this is a whimsical, magical, action-packed middle grade from um, the lovely Samantha, who's an author, writer, and editor from Melbourne. If you're a fan of Nevermore, this one's definitely for you. And if you're a, a simp for beautiful covers, you have to check this one out. It is gorgeous. Did you just um, say if you're a simp for beautiful yeah, covers? I did. I said okay. a simp. <laughs> What's a That's better great. word? <laughs> Um, so you've got like a fascinating magic system, unconventional families. Uh, it's the first book in a new portal fantasy series. I especially loved the main characters, Celeste and Esme. They're bickering sisters who are endlessly fighting with each other and for each other. Um, and we follow the story through Celeste's eyes and she's like the big sister and she has big sister energy. She's always grumpy because she always has to be in charge and take the responsibility and she just wants to live a little. Um, both their parents always are off on some like archeological adventure and leave their kids at home with their grandmother. So they're always bored and she's always having to pick up after her little sister who is very cheeky and annoying, might I say. Um, anyway, their eccentric cousin Ferdinand falls out of the sky. He lives in <laughs> seven wherewithal way or and the whole world is called wherewithal way. It's like a like a waypoint between the many magical realms that exist and are unreachable from Earth. And you know it's got magic and mystery and all these enchanting creatures. And the place he lives at um, is kind of like a halfway home for the creatures that have been kicked out of other various realms. It's a wonderful little place. So he whisks his cousins away to there to you know let them have some fun. But what he doesn't tell them is that there's a bit of chaos going on in the realm and they're going to have to go on these big and scary adventures, which for Celeste, it's just something she doesn't want entirely. It's very out of her personality to do these things and be a risk taker. Um, but, you know, as the adventure goes on, she really grows into herself and finds that she has the most fun when she's in these sorts of situations. Um, and it becomes kind of like a life or death thing. And if she wants to help save her cousin, his home and their world and its inhabitants, which she's come to love, she's going to have to like find and delve into her adventurous side. Um, it's, it's, it's a really lovely story, but there's also a very dark and evil parts to it, which like, you know, middle grades tend to have that, but maybe not as much as this one, but for some reason that made me like it all the more like you have Baba Yaga and you have all her evil little creatures and the setups for all of these like situations they find themselves in. They're just, they're amazing. And I just, I loved it so much. I would well, really it, recommend anyone to read it. You don't have to be, you know, a middle grade reader per se, but I think you would still enjoy it. It sounds like it's a good book for anybody who is a simp for a good story. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly it. Am I using that phrase correctly? Um, is it yes, offensive? Yes, you are. Okay, good. <laughs> no. <laughs> good. I, I had a milestone birthday this, this week that we won't go into detail on, but um, yeah, that's young people speak. I'm glad I'm doing it properly. All right. Thank you it. very much for that, Eden. Um, and just a reminder to listeners that uh, for all the books that are mentioned in today's podcast, uh, we've got links to them in the show notes for this episode, but you can also just head over to booktopia.com.au and search for the books that we've mentioned and any other books you want. You should check it out. It's a pretty good website. All right, moving on. So I have Amy and Danny. I have been informed that Amy, that uh, Danny has seven books to talk about, so we might leave you to the end. Um, sorry, so, not sorry. <laughs> uh, so Amy, what have you got for us? Uh, I have two books that I wanted to talk about. 
Um, the first one I actually read a few months ago just before we went into lockdown. Um, I think everyone in the office um, knew when I received this book because I lost my mind. Um, my One of my favourite books ever is um, Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe by Benjamin Ali Sayans. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, and it's just this really, really lovely young adult book about these two boys um, in the 80s in a small town in America who meet and spend a summer becoming best friends and they teach each other about family and about growing up and it is just the nicest book I, I've ever read. I reread it at least once a year and it's my favourite and the author finally announced uh, a sequel uh, all of 11 years later. The first book came out in 2012. So I was so excited to read the sequel and to see where these characters uh, have come along to. And it is a big book and a lot happens. So the second book, they're learning what it means to be two young gay men in the 80s. And this is right at the beginning of the AIDS crisis. Um, and so there's some really interesting storylines about that and then about what the people in their life think about them and how they are reacting to that. Um, and it's their last year of high school and they're figuring out what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. And it's a really, really nice book. I sobbed multiple, multiple times. My favourite thing about this series, the first book and definitely the second book, is there's a big theme about family and even though it's about young love and kind of figuring out who you are it's also about figuring out who your parents are because when you're a kid your parents are just your parents they're characters in your story but a big thing in this series is kind of growing up and realizing that your parents have their own lives and their own struggles and you know, that's kind of affected how they do things with you. And so there's some really, really lovely things with um, the character Aristotle and his mum and dad that just makes it such a lovely book. But warning, it is very sad, um, but well worth the 11 year wait for that one. I, I, do, I like that sounds lovely, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know if I can read another queer narrative that brings me to tears. It happens too often. It's definitely a cry fest. Um, the audiobook is also amazing. It's um, done by Lynn, Lynn Manuel Miranda. Uh, oh, really? She has a beautiful voice. Oh, yeah, that's awesome. so I just listen to that one all the time. So soothing. Even Brilliant. though it's super sad, that's probably a bit messed up. <laughs> Um, so last week I read The Charm Offensive by Alison Cochran. Um, this is a new adult novel, I would say. Um, it came out in the end of October. And when I first heard about this book, I knew I was going to read it. It is right up my alley. Um, it has the big red, white and royal blue comparisons splashed all over the marketing and then the description, which usually I'm like, oh, okay, it won't. This is the first book I have read that actually I have said, this is like red, white and royal blue. Um, so I think that's a very big endorsement for uh, anyone who's read that book. Um, but it is about an awkward tech entrepreneur called Charlie, whose publicist forces him to go on a reality dating show to clean up his image and help him get his job back. And he's sent on this show called Ever After. And Ever After is basically the worst reality dating show you could ever imagine. Think of every bad trope, um, every horrible thing you hear about um, filming until 3 a.m. and contestants being made to drink alcohol to make poor decisions. It is just the worst production going. Um, and he's sold down the river onto this to try and find love. And besides being the most awkward person ever on camera, um, everything starts to go off script when he meets his producer, Dev, who is probably the shining light of the Ever, Laugh, Ever After franchise. He truly believes in happily ever afters and he's a true romantic. And no matter what anyone says, he thinks they are helping people find their person. Um, so they meet and they really open up to each other and it's a beautiful story about mental illness and letting somebody love you and learning all those beautiful things about, you know, what makes you, you. And it is just a lovely book. They traverse around the world. It is so much fun. 
Um, I cried, I laughed. It was beautiful. That sounds great. And the red, white, and royal blue uh, comparison, that's a, that's, bold, that's a bold statement. I know. I told everybody. I was like, it actually is. Believe me. <laughs> Who needs a dating <laughs> site that's even worse? Like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we can all probably do without that. But uh, that sounds like a great book and a lot of fun. Thank you, Amy. All right. Um, Danny, Ooh. over to you. With, well, I just um, wanted to say happy birthday, Mark. And what, what's this milestone? You look too young to have any kind of milestone birthday to me. Thank you. That, it was 21. That, oh, yeah. right. Of course. It was my 21st. Yeah, 21. That back. explains everything. Happy milestone. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. You ready? I am ready. All right. Uh, buckle up because i got seven, uh, but I talk really fast. So here goes. I'm going to start with Trent Dalton Love Stories. Of course, you would have to be living in a cave if you did not know about this book. It's an absolute gift. For those who don't know, Trent sat on a street corner in Brisbane listening to people's love stories. It is love, hope, optimism, and just listening to people, which, you know, sometimes we don't get the time to do. Reading this book helps you understand others, understand yourself. And I just had the most glorious chat with him because he's a bit of a heart on, a, on his sleeve guy. And I love that sort of stuff. So we just delved into all of this, you know, deep, wonderful things. But even the book, it feels beautiful. And the first time you open it up, I just have to read, I've paraphrased this, of course, but Trent starts with what he believes in. And I think we should all write this list and we should frame it on our walls because when um, you know we get busy or we get frustrated with our loved ones we should go back and look at this so I'm going to read it real fast I believe we are not alone in the universe I believe in hoping realistically grieving openly dreaming wildly making up quickly making love slowly weeping freely and I still have time to fix all the things in my life that need fixing so this kind of it goes on for a lot longer but I just paraphrase it there but it really sets the tone of the book of just putting your heart on the page as Trent always does and then getting other people to put their love stories in his hands to create this beautiful anthology of real life love stories it's an absolute gift and it's one of those books that you want to touch and you want to smell which is you know obviously all of our favorite things we're sitting here doing you know this is what this is who we are people so that's my first one. Oh, and can I just can I just jump in and say we also have an interview with Trent Dalton that's out on the podcast channel right now and um, Love Stories is a uh, book of the month at Booktopia for the month Ooh, of November. Great. So check that out. Yeah. yeah, listen to both the podcasts because he always just explores something different. He's a great talker. So yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Uh, number two, Treasure and Dirt by Chris Hammer. This has to be my favorite title of the month, Treasure and Dirt. I just loved it. True to form, Chris Hammer delivers another gritty, dark, masculine crime thriller, thriller set in opal mining country. It's really Australian. His characters are beautifully drawn. And I just love his writing. You know when you read crime and you, you sometimes it's just about plot and character, which is great and fine, but when you read Chris's writing, it's just beautiful. It's really up there with the best of Aussie crime fic, you know, Jane Harper, Candace Fox, all the crime greats that we have in our country at the moment. But Treasure and Dirt, it's just it's amazing. I was going to say it's a gold mine. It's an opal mine. <laughs> so <laughs> get your hands on that. Have you read that one, anyone? I haven't, um, but it was, it was no, actually, I haven't. Our, I haven't. It, was, it was our book of the month in October. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm picking all the books of the month. Can I keep doing this? <laughs> <laughs> and I know Nick, Nick, our friend, he's read it too. And he loved it as well. I'm there with you, Nick. Uh, the third one, The Fatal Dance by Bernd Selheim. Now, this was something that I really wanted to read because I just felt it was um, really interesting exploring Huntington's disease and inspired by a personal story. And if you know anything about Huntington's disease, it's, you know, a disease that's really degenerative and creeps up on you slowly. And if one of your parents have it, you have like a 50% chance of getting this disease. And it's really interesting about the psychology of it. Because if you think about it, you think, yeah, of course I want to know. But you only want to know if you probably don't have it, right? <laughs> so some people who had that, you know, genetic uh, history, sometimes they didn't find out because they thought their lives would, you know, sort of be absolutely transformed if they did find out and it was the answer they didn't want. What really was beautiful about this book was how beautifully it was written. It is so literary, but not in a way that gets in the way of the plot or the story. It was just really beautifully put together. It took him a long time to write and you kind of can feel that in the way the sentences are constructed. I feel like, you know, when you read a book and you feel like every sentence has had love and care, I feel like this was with this book. So it was beautiful. As well as that, it's got this amazing flawed character who, um, you know, Bert said, you know, he was, he was a terrible person. I was like, oh, I liked him. 
<laughs> so I don't know what that says about me, guys, but um, it's really interesting about all the things about bodies and sex and being present with the time that we have right now, which again is really important for our present because we're so busy and we're multitasking or doing that badly and we're on our phones. I'm so guilty of that. Uh, but this is really about what are you going to do with the time and the moment that you have right now? Because whether or not you have been, you know, unfortunate enough to have an illness that, you know, impacts your life, none of us know what's ahead of us for tomorrow. So it's a really interesting question about what are you going to do with the time right now? Anyone read The Fatal Dance? Do it. Put it on your nope. list. <laughs> uh, going to go down to a little bit of sort of YA stuff now. Um, I read If Not Us by Mark Smith. I just love Mark's YA work. I think he just does such a great job of just tapping into those young characters. I mean, he's worked with young people for a long time. He set at this one beachside, beach town, and if anyone knows Mark, he's a surfy. So it just seemed to fit perfectly and he seemed so at ease in that setting. Um, and I find with Mark his settings are really, really powerful, you know, just as powerful as his characters. So I really enjoyed that story uh, for and I enjoy his settings um, and his stories. He explores the relationships between two culturally different teenagers, childhood trauma and anxiety, which he deals with in a really, um, a really appropriate way. So it's, I think it's a novel that young readers will really love and tap into. And I also think it will tap into those readers who may be a little bit of a reluctant reader because your readers sort of drop off in your YA a bit because, who knows, teenagers have lots of fun things they could be doing. Um, but reading is fun, kids. Uh, so, yeah, I think it really taps into those readers who um, might, might be a little bit reluctant as well. So that is tops. And keeping with the YA theme, I read this amazing anthology called Hometown Haunts, and apparently this is the first Love Oz YA anthology just to focus on horror entirely. It's got a stellar cast, including Ooh. Holden Shepard, Sarah Epstein, Poppy Nwosu, Y Chim, and a host of other talented um, people writing little tiny stories, horror stories. And they're also different because we were talking about, you know, it's like crime. The horror genre is so massive. You know, you can just go for scare tactics. You can go for blood and guts. You can go for the psychological. You can go for the creepy. You can go for the scare the pants of you. These aren't official genres, by the way. I've just made them up. But, you know, you can do all different things in horror. And... It will scare you. Like they were really, really good stories. But the remarkable thing that I found with this was talking to people and often, you know, genres like horror are sort of undermined as like, oh, you know, that's not literary. It's just horror, whatever. But we talked about how writing horror and reading or watching horror really helps you work through your own horrors or experiences or, or bad things that have happened in your life because they're about resilience. They're about surviving these Kind of catastrophic moments with these characters that you don't meet every day. So we talked about how, you know, psychologically speaking, they can actually be quite helpful in terms of working out your own stuff. So I loved it. Um, it was really interesting that one, two or three of the authors, are Holden and Way being two of them, they just, they, they hate horror. They don't watch it. They don't read it. And it was really interesting because they were able to write these really remarkable uh, horror short stories. And that's why I said to them, well, I think somewhere along the line, whether you like them or hate them, you absorb them, you know, somehow in yeah. your life. And so it was really interesting that even though you didn't immer they didn't immerse themselves in that genre, they could certainly, you know, tap into that. So it's, it's really interesting about horror and the human experience. Um, that I love sounds, that. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. I, I don't know if we've ever discussed this before, Danny, but I'm a massive horror nerd. Like it's, it's, my, it's my, my passion. I read all kinds of horror. So that sounds really, really good. And I think you did, you did a good job of encapsulating all the different subgenres. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the fly. What would you add there, Mark, being a horror sort of fan? Uh, what did I miss? <laughs> uh, cosmic horror. Ooh. So that's like Cthulhu and, and things like that with the elder gods and like the we're alone in a cold, uncaring universe full of powerful creatures that uh, we mean nothing to. Yeah. Oh my God, Mark. We that's very depressing hot. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we need to have, that's said strangely, I'm excited about it. Um, we need to have a horror episode where we just talk horror. <laughs> Definitely. I'd totally be up for that. <laughs> I grew up on a diet of Freddy Krueger, <laughs> um, Chainsaw Massacre, and just loved all that stuff. So, And oh, we were talking about the Japanese films. They are just terrifying, right, those Japanese yes, horror yeah. films. They're my favourite because they always scare the pants of you far more than any other movies. That's cool. We're going to have to talk, Mark. We're going to have to talk more horror. You can teach me things. Definitely. Two more books, people. Two more. I promise I'll stop talking. Aurora's End. Uh, Jay Christoph and Amy Kaufman. I mean, what an incredible duo these pair 
Era. This is the third and final book of the series. Brilliant conclusion to this much loved trilogy. It was probably for me the most action packed book. The fans will love it. I know there was a lot of distress and heartbreak about book two because there was such a you know huge cliffhanger and people had to wait the year for the book three. But this will fix and mend all your broken hearts, readers, if you're hanging out for this book. I feel like the characters have been really incredibly well loved and people are really passionate about these characters, which I love because a book, you know, you want books to make you feel things. And Amy was saying it before about crying about books. And I love that. Not many books can make me cry, but when they do, you go, yeah, that's tapped into something, you know, really special inside yourself. So people have loved these characters. And, you know, the good thing about this is if you haven't started this series, well, you can just go and start it now with no weight. You can just binge the books like you binge Netflix. So um, the torturous weight will be over for you. But that was a really cool book. And I really liked speaking to Jane Amy in their process of writing and how they um, don't tell you which characters they write and they plan a hundred pages ahead um, and that's it. And then they go away and write and then they come back again and plan. So it's a really cool um, way of collaboration because I don't know that you can collaborate easily with people. These two seem to have done it pretty significantly well. Last book, loved at a picture book in there, uh, Rory the Lion by Rory H. Mather. This picture book is just beautiful and I really love the illustrations. It's some of the best illustrations I've seen, I reckon, but it's a cute story about a lion finding his place. I love a great pick book and that was my pick book pick for October and I'm done. I'm done. Seven books. I don't know how many minutes. I hope it was short. That was, that was great, Danny. That, that was a marathon. You made it through. You never faltered. You never stumbled. Well done. Well done. You, you need to have a drink now. <laughs> I am. I am having a drink. <laughs> well, um, Amy, Eden and Danny, uh, thank you so much for telling us what to read. That was fantastic. Um, and to the listeners, thank you for tuning in. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can find links to all of the books that have been discussed today in the show notes. Or you can just head over to booktopia.com.au and search for any book and we will get it to you. Check out the website. It's a good one. Uh, We all think so. As always, thank you for listening and never stop reading.